Coming to you from the Toby Family Auditorium at the Commonwealth Club, it's week to week, the political roundtable for Tuesday, July 30th, 2019. Now, the debate, of course, is going to be the big topic for tonight, though another thing we'll talk about is the, uh, uh, the testimony, excuse me, by Robert Mueller before two uh, House committees. Um, Democrats were deflated by the experience. Uh, many of them were hoping to hear that the president committed crimes and could be convicted, arrested, impeached. Um, such critics of the president might be enlightened to learn a little bit of trivia. So, in fact, you can arrest a president. And in fact, it has happened. Police officer William West arrested a president, and there was no problem with the entire thing. West, ar West arrested Ulysses S. Grant in 1872. The crime? Speeding. Yes, speeding on a horse. <laughs> Grant admitted his guilt and even told the officer he was correct to arrest him. Uh, Grant paid the $20 fine and was released. So there's your trivia for the, the deflated Democrats. Um, I'm John Zipper, your host for Week to Week, and I'm glad to be here with our panel and all of you and everyone watching and listening online. Before we continue, if you've got a cell phone or a, any other noisemaker in your pocket, please silence it. We are, of course, both streaming and uh, recording this for future playback. So everyone's welcome at the Commonwealth Club. Doesn't matter if you're on the right, left, or the center. Any opinions that are expressed up here on the uh, stage are those of the speakers and not of the Commonwealth Club. So let's meet the people on the stage today. We'll start on the far end of the stage with Carson Bruno. He's the Assistant Dean and Adjunct Lecturer in the School of Public Policy at Pepperdine University, and he's on Twitter at Carson J.F. Bruno. So welcome back, Carson. Thank you. Thank you. Joining our panel for the first time, a big welcome to Tim Anaya. He's the Communications Director at the Pacific Research Institute. He's co-host of PRI's Next Round podcast. He's former Director of Writing for the California Assembly Republicans, and he's on Twitter at Tim Anaya. So welcome, Tim. Thanks for having me. And next to me is Barbara Marshman, the former Editorial Pages Editor of the Mercury News. She's also a member of the Commonwealth Club's Silicon Valley Advisory Board, and she's on Twitter at Barb Marshman. So good to see you again, Barb. I think you all know how we do this. There are question cards spread throughout the room. Please write down some questions you have, and our volunteers will collect them, and I will try to work in as many as possible during our time here today. Now, you just spent 90 minutes of your life <laughs> listening to Democratic presidential candidates in the first of the two nights of the second round of their primary debates. Um, this composes, or between the two, it comprises 20 of the 24, I believe, uh, Democrats who are still running. Um, the 10 candidates who got to debate tonight, of course, were Steve Bullock, Pete Buttigieg, John Delaney, John Hickenlooper, Amy Klobuchar, Beto O'Rourke, Tim Ryan, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, and Marianne Williamson. So, panelists, first question. Um, who do you think helped themselves the most in what we saw so far of the debate? Uh, start on the far end with Carson. Uh, I would say probably, definitely in her own tier is Elizabeth Warren, senator from uh, Massachusetts. Uh, she <clears throat> seemed very poised. She, she obviously has gr uh, improved her debating skills over the course of her political career. I remember seeing her way back when, when she was the acting director of the CFPB, uh, because she couldn't get confirmed, actually, to that position by the Republican Senate in D.C. Um, she seemed very academic at that point, almost like you're listening to your professor talk a very boring lecture um, on very boring topics. <laughs> Here, she seems much more in her own skin in terms of kind of who she is in her, in her political sense. And I think that's really helping her on the stage, really setting her apart from the person she needs to set herself apart the most, Senator uh, Bernie Sanders. So I would say her. Tim. I think right now we don't really know the answer to that question because if you watched the first debate a few weeks ago, the second debate really sucked all the oxygen out of the room with the first debate and you probably don't remember anything that was said in the first debate. So I think tweet me on Thursday and ask that question of who won, uh, who won the debate. But I would say just watching backstage and it's too bad you all weren't backstage with us because we had a great time watching everything. <laughs> we, we had a glass of wine is what <laughs> he said. We did. Uh, <laughs> you did too, that's right. 
I think that um, the people who got more screen time tonight probably helped themselves. So Congressman Delaney, whether you agree with what he said or not, you know, they're all going for that extra 1% to get into the next uh, debate. So I would think more screen time means more uh, recognition. I think Mayor Pete also was pretty impressive in the way that he handled um, the questions and answers as well. Barbara? Yeah, Mayor Pete was was low key, but I I, I think he's still holding his own. Uh, I, the other young, unlikely candidate um, from Texas, uh, I, I think you know Beto is 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 fading away. I agree that Elizabeth Warren came off the best and strongest, but then I am not um, I'm not a big well I'm not a huge Warren fan. I'm not a Bernie fan at all. So. Um, but I thought I thought she uh, did well and held up well against the guy in her own area. Disappointed that Amy Klobuchar doesn't uh, get a little more attention, because the more I see her, the more interested I am in her, and she has actually done things, which is the problem with Buttigieg. I you know I love what he says most of the time, but you really you really need to have someone who's done things. John Hickenlooper has done things, and I've spent time with John Hickenlooper. I once moderate. I was once the John Zipperer for a an on stage discussion for the Silicon Valley Leadership Group of John Hickenlooper and Jerry Brown, and it was a riot. <laughs> and and he was Hickenlooper was just wonderful. Just and I remember when he left thinking man, I hope he gum goes somewhere, you know. Uh, he's been very lackluster through these debates. I think, I think he's probably toast, but I'm disappointed in that. Wow. Well, uh, if you were with us for the last week to week, you remember probably that I kind of gave Marianne Williamson a hard time, mainly by quoting her. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I will say, and I'm not saying she, she's the standout candidate. I, I think I would agree. Uh, is it John Delaney? Mm -hmm. yeah. John Delaney established himself, I think, in people's minds more so than everyone who didn't know who he was before this debate. But I will say, Marianne Williamson, I thought, did a good job of saying, of getting across, this is where I stand, I'm on, you know, I, she wasn't quoting, you know, you're the paint and think of yourselves as the fume. That, I mean, she, she was saying, no, this is what we believe. Yeah, I mean, she was forthright. I think she... As you know, she, we may well see her in the next round of debates. She may be at 2%, but still, that's enough to get into the next round of debates. And I'd say we would argue, too, she probably had the best of the opening statements, which we all didn't yeah. like having opening statements, period. Yeah, but I thought, yeah. I thought they weren't going to do those. But, yeah. but I think hers was the best of the opening statements. Yeah, on my way, I missed the opening statements because I was traveling in from Oakland Airport, but most of the focus on Twitter was about uh, Mayor Pete's shoes, that he went with brown shoes with a blue suit, which I don't see anything wrong with that. <laughs> uh, I agree with Mayor Pete, clearly. Uh, but also Twitter was very favorable to Marianne Williamson's <clears throat> opening speech as well, uh, opening statement as well. Uh, so apparently the masses, uh, at least the few thousand people I follow, um, thought so as well. I, I mentioned this backstage, and I, I kind of feel free to applaud or not if you think of the same. If Al Franken had not resigned, do you think he would have been on stage either tonight or tomorrow night? Yes. Yep. No. <laughs> I got people to clap. My night is done. <laughs> um, so Elizabeth Warren and uh, Kamala Harris, of course, were kind of the two who really got a boost out of the first round of debates. Really, again, the, the second debate in the, in the first round. Um, Elizabeth Warren probably did herself, I think we're all in agreement, did herself uh, good tonight. Um, what do you think the, this is now really to, to ask you to talk about tomorrow's debate before you see it, but what do you think Harris, Senator Harris, watching tonight and knowing what she needs to do to keep the momentum going. She's definitely gotten herself into the top tier there. Um, actually, Tim, I mean, you've worked inside politics. What advice right. would you give her? Well, I'd say, A, looking at what was discussed tonight, she better brush up on health care and oh, be man. ready for all of the slings and arrows because she put out, for those who uh, may have followed the news this week, um, she put out her own health care plan that I think kind of tried to be all things to all sides of the health care debate. 
Um, and I think that, um, you know, in that kind of a setting, you know, when you're 60 seconds here and there and going back and forth and I'm the true believer and I'm the most committed on this, you know, she could suddenly find herself being the one taking all the fire tomorrow night rather than what you might expect uh, uh, Vice President Biden to be. So uh, I'd be ready with every, uh, every conceivable challenge that you might get on her health care plan because uh, I think there are candidates sitting in war rooms somewhere across Detroit right now uh, writing up all of their questions and doing up all their oppo research on that. Barbara? Yeah, this was, this was interesting because I, they went on a very long time debating health care, and, and it was interesting to let them debate, although some folks went on forever. Um, but even when they turned to immigration, when the questions turned to immigration and other subjects, it kept circling back to health care. Should, should undocumented immigrants get free health care? Um, so it's clearly the topic of the week, if not the campaign. And, and I, I agree, she'd better be careful on health care. And I'm sure she's rehearsing zingers for Joe. <laughs> Carson? Well, hopefully she's not rehearsing too much because something that uh, Senator Harris does not do well is when she goes too rehearsed. Yeah. Um, and because it comes off, comes off very insincere um, in how she is able to say it. And um, I don't know why, I don't know what, she's been in the public sphere for a very long time, but it seems like something that she hasn't quite really figured out in terms of really kind of going for it over and over and over again. Now she did a very good job in that in the first debate, uh, but then you did, if you noticed the first debate, she went for it and pulled back nicely um, mm -hmm. and allowed then the rest of it to kind of just happen. Uh, yeah. organically uh, by the other candidates on stage, but then also kind of the Twitterverse as well as the media. Um, and so that's really what she needs to do if she wants to ma maintain its momentum. People are expecting her to go head to head against Biden, given the fact that they are the two top, top tier uh, candidates in that second debate. Uh, what she needs to worry about is kind of what everyone else are going to be doing. And, and a little bit of kind of what was happening tonight and is continuing to happen tonight, it, people are not just thinking about their campaigns as a whole, they're thinking about that September debate. You know, yeah. What do they need to do to get, you know, to get to the donor level, to get to the polling level, to get, make sure they stay on that stage and live another day uh, in this campaign? Because that's really what it's all about, making sure you live another day until the Iowa caucuses roll around, and then you hope that you hit 15% threshold in that Iowa caucus to get some delegates to move on into the New Hampshire and vice and so forth. What's not really being talked about too much here is that 15% threshold and it's gonna be vital. No one is hitting really that 15% threshold right now yeah. except Joe Biden, and on occasion, you have Sanders, Warren, and Harris, but not always. And so if you're not hitting 15% in a lot of these early states, you're not gonna get any delegates. And at which point then your entire campaign is, is, is worthless. I mean, if yeah. you don't get delegates, you can't continue right. onward. Uh, and so these campaigns are really thinking not only about how do I get into the, into the next debate, especially kind of those hovering in the you know, one, two, five, six, seven percents, yeah. uh, but then also kind of how do I make, them, make sure I get into the 15% threshold to ensure that I'm actually winning delegates. That's an interesting point too that, and I think you kind of see it tonight with, uh, you know, when the candidates are asked a particular question, and then you find that they give an answer on some totally unrelated thing. <laughs> but what they're doing there is, and this is something that when I've helped prepare elected officials for media interviews and editorial page interviews and debates, you know, when you have the microphone, you can say whatever you want. So they're just looking for what sticks. And, you know, if there, you saw when we got into the discussion of immigration, there was a lot of discussion of campaign finance reform. Well, that's a big issue for a big constituency in the party. And so those candidates weighed, you know, the opportunity of, yep, I can speak for 30 seconds on immigration, but I really want to get my message out there to an organized constituency that may win me some dividends going toward that third debate and going toward uh, hopefully getting their 15%. Which is why I find it odd, and I don't know the rules for all of the DNC debates moving f as we kind of move forward and forward closer to January, uh, but I do find it a little bit odd that they're focusing on national polls, because mm -hmm. we don't hold a national presidential election, let alone a national primary, uh, and it really is 50 kind of primaries and caucuses 
luckily fewer caucuses, um, happening all around the country. And so uh, what really matters to these candidates are not what the national polls say. Those are meaningless. It's what's happening in really the early states and then as you move toward the Super Tuesday states in March. Uh, Barbara mentioned how it kept circling back to health care. I mean, the first 45 minutes of it, according to my watch, was uh, health care, I mean specifically health care, and then as she said, it kept kind of going back to health care where other things, sometimes they would make a connection between it, and other times, uh, and I forget which of the candidates there specifically was talking about needing to address gun violence as a health care issue. We have a question from the audience as be kind of a way of getting into the health care issue more, more specifically. What are your opinions on combining racial issues, gun issues, and drug use issues as a public health concern instead of uh, unsuccessfully and ineffectively addressing all three separately? Um, oh, sorry. I, I think absolutely uh, gun violence in particular. I mean, the, the CDC has wanted to do that. Uh, federal health agencies have wanted to do that. And the Senate, and this is just not since Trump, this is going back years, the Senate has refused to give them money to study that issue. I mean, they have specifically said no to requests to study gun violence as a health care issue. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, drugs and other things, it, it also makes sense. I think it's one thing, I think it's very different as a policy debate versus mm -hmm. on a campaign stage, a debate stage. Yeah. And so I would wonder, you know, we're all kind of sophisticated people who follow these things. I wonder if this is the first time you've watched, you know, if you're a casual observer of politics, would you necessarily make that connection? Yeah. Would, would you see them all inter, intermixed? I think you could build toward that, but, you know, in 60 seconds, that's a hard thing to do. You know, these are conversations you could have for right. hours. You could have a whole forum just on these issues. So I think it's a challenge in this kind of environment to link everything together and make that bring the audience along for that longer philosophical debate. Yeah. I'll have to, I mean, I agree with both Barbara and Tim on this in the sense that from a policy side, yeah, there's no such thing as a policy silo. Housing policy is environmental policy, it's transportation policy, it's water policy, it's, you can continue on. Yeah, healthcare policy can be, it's, it's a mental health policy which connects back to gun violence and, 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 and th those sort of issues. Uh, so the, the fact that we tend to silo policies in these little kind of corridors is because of news bites and, and sound bites, really. Uh, and so it makes it hard for you to really kind of build that bridge, even when you just have two people standing on stage. Mm -hmm. When it just comes down to President Trump versus whoever the Democratic nominee is, they have to talk in sound bites and short clips because A, that's what you'll be tweeting, B, that's what you'll remember. Um, and that's the fact of the matter of what these sort of venues are like. Now, if for those of us who really go in and read the policy, you know, uh, briefs and white papers, and for the people actually in the le legislature and Congress trying to go through these issues, absolutely it should be more comprehensive and, and breaking down those silos. Uh, but in terms of the political theater, which is what that is and will continue to be, no matter what we think of it, um, it it's, it's really hard to, to do that. Yeah. And I think too, and this is something that in political communication. My dear friend, Marcy Brightwell, if you don't know her, she was a legend of TV political journalism in Sacramento, and now she's in the PR world. And she's often asked to give advice to elected officials and staff and candidates on how do you talk to media and how do you um, get your message across. And she always says, on, especially for television, you have 10 seconds to get your message across. So that means you have time really to say one, maybe two sentences if you're lucky. And so in the way that we cover news nationally especially, there just isn't the time to get all of that across in what could be a 60 second story on the news at night. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, let me combine a couple questions here. Um, they're really kind of asking the flip sides of the same thing, which is, and, and one of the questioners, uh, one of the moderators asked this question tonight, which, or mentioned this, that a lot of Democrats, I don't know if it was a majority, are saying, we're less interested if this candidate lines up exact ideologically on everything we believe, we want someone who will defeat Donald Trump. <laughs> so the question is, just from what we've seen tonight, so forget about tomorrow, just and what we've seen before, just from tonight, 
who do you think Democrats would have the most confidence in uh, in being able to go head to head, for example, even in a debate with Donald Trump, who is going to be unconventional, is going to be very aggressive, and you know he, he scored a lot, even though he was rated as having lost the debates. I think he really probably was very effective in them. Carson. <laughs> Oof. <laughs> <laughs> Hoping for tomorrow night here. Yes. <laughs> I mean, here's the thing. And your time is I mean, up. Okay, yeah. Tim. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. always wanted to do that. I mean, Sorry. here's the thing. I mean, it, it's, it's, I don't want to say it's hard to say, but it's hard to say. Um, <laughs> be, fr from a tenacity standpoint, Elizabeth Warren definitely had it there tonight. Yeah. From, but I don't think she will play well um, once she gets out of the blue east west coast areas. I mean, she doesn't even really have that great of a, an approval rating in her own home state of Mass Commonwealth of Massachusetts, uh, one of the bluest places in the entire country. Um, and so uh, I just don't see how she really gets to the, the psyche of the type of voters that you, you need to flip um, the states that, that Trump won and Hillary Clinton lost. Uh, so, I mean, from people up there, I mean, I feel like the, the, the Steve Bullocks and the John Delaney's and th those sort of people actually have the best chance of actually going head to head with Donald Trump in terms of building the electoral college coalition that you need. Now, can they survive him on the debate stage? No, I don't think so. Yeah. John Delaney might. He really so showed some really kind of vigor this evening. But, yeah. um, but I mean, he's a X number former congressman from Maryland. It's like, how is he going to really compete against the president of the United States? You know, it, it's tough in, in that regard. So yeah. um, it, it's, it, it's, I don't know. It's, I think at this stage of time, it's too hard to really tell because there are too many people still on stage. Yeah. Uh, the fact of the matter. And in fact, we have two nights of it. I mean, yeah. I also think if, um, I totally agree, no, no clue from the group tonight. I think Bernie might be the strongest debater, but I, I don't think I'd want to watch that debate. <laughs> um, I, I think it's a real question whether people, people, everybody's saying that, we just want to win. But ultimately, people are going to, think about who they like best and think that's who's going to win. So the people who love Bernie, I think will vote for Bernie, Bernie and Elizabeth has her, has her following. And, and uh, so I'm not sure that will go very far to determine the outcome of primaries. What do you think? Too? That's always the challenge, right? In a primary, it's heads versus hearts. Yeah. And I think right now, You've probably got four people who could win, which I would say Biden, Sanders, Warren, and Harris. Um, you know, I agree too that you know there are a lot of people on that stage who you know you could tell tonight would make great general election debaters. Yeah. But they're at one percent. They're not going to make yeah. it anywhere. Um, my other kind of controversial prediction, which you can revisit next <laughs> fall. I don't believe Donald Trump is going to participate in general election debates. Really? Ah. Hmm. So we That's could be having this discussion. Thought. But yeah. because the, the risk is, you know, one of these candidates, and you could totally see a Warren or a Harris having the, the famous, you know, have you no decency moment in yes. his face. And how yes. would he respond to that? Yeah. He's not going to put himself in that huh. position. That's my prediction. So come back, in, come back in November, and we'll see if I'm right. But that's my prediction. Well, right and, and, and I kind of wondered, because, of course, there is someone running against Donald Trump in the Republican primary. Yeah. Uh, William Weld, if for whatever states will actually allow him on, on the ballot. But the, the liberal Republican, moderate Republican, however you, you want to define him, but he, former governor of New Jersey is... Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Massachusetts? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One of those blue, <laughs> bluish states. I think he's going to have a problem. And nonetheless, <laughs> Trump wouldn't have to debate him either, and there would be no upside for him to do it, right, in the well, primaries? And that's, I mean, I, to answer your question and also kind of circle back to what, what Tim, Tim's point was here, uh, A, people were having the same conversations about the Republicans in 2016, who we want someone who's going to be the best to you know, beat Hillary Clinton. No right. one was saying that was Donald Trump. Yeah, yeah. Ever, actually. On election day, no one was saying that was <laughs> yeah, Donald yeah. Trump. 
<laughs> Not even Donald Trump. <laughs> no. Right. So, so right. I mean, if people are going to vote for who, who they think. I mean, Trump voters thought he was going to be the one to yeah. beat Hillary Clinton. Um, and so uh, it, it's, a, it's, it's not a yes or no sort of situation. It's very much back to you, you like someone because you like their policies and their stances or their personality or all the above. And you then also think because of that, they're going to be the one to win the election. All those people on stage think that they're going to win the presidency. Yes, there might be other reasons why they're running for president, but no one runs for president of, of that sort of caliber uh, who doesn't think that they honestly can do the job nor win. Um, and because it's hard work, it's tedious work, it's unthankful work, it, it's just, it's grueling. And so um, they all think that they are the ones to beat Donald Trump, and they, they better think that, otherwise they're... they're legitimately crazy. Um, but to go back to what kind of uh, what Tim was saying also, I think it's also really important to remember that whoever comes out of this gauntlet is going to have debated a lot. Yeah. A lot. Because if you're making it out and becoming the nominee, you're, you're going to be in every single one of those debates. Yeah. So you're going to have a lot of practice. You're going to have your talking points down pat. You're going to know the nuances. You're going to know the candence. You're going to really be able to kind of hit hard in a way that um, the president will not have been able to do. And it's kind of the reverse. Hillary Clinton, she skated through. I mean, yes, they had debates, but Bernie Sanders was really her comp competition there and realistically wasn't that massive of a threat you know, to her actually winning the nomination. Um, whereas Donald Trump <coughs> really had to go hard at the debates over and over and over again. Uh, so he came out of it actually much stronger than, of a debater than he walked into it and caught Hillary Clinton, I think, off guard in that regard. Isn't it a rule of thumb that in the general election debate, the president never takes their challenger seriously? Mm -hmm. And the history of first presidential debates, ask President Romney, he did pretty well in the first debate. Yeah. And a lot of people were saying gee, this is a totally different race after tonight. Ask yeah. President Mondale, you know, how he did in the first <laughs> presidential debate. So that definitely will be a play here, yeah. too. Yeah. Which I think was what <coughs> kind of nipped Joe Biden the last debate. Um, he kind of got into that complacency of him being the incumbent in a way because he <coughs> is the vice president, or at least the last vice president. Um, and Last Democratic vice president. <laughs> yeah, well... True. Yes, that's a good point. Yeah. Forgot about that. Last former vice president. <laughs> uh, and I think he'll, he'll come back a lot stronger tomorrow night. What had also been said, and I know we talked about it here uh, in 2008, those primaries, those Democratic primary debates, um, Hillary Clinton and uh, Barack Obama, they <coughs> both improved a lot because they both got into it and realized this is tougher, and they both had to up the game, and they both did. And obviously only one of them could win, but... Um, among the topics that they talked about tonight that we saw so far uh, was fairly briefly um, uh, the climate and climate change and, and such. Uh, they got into the Green New Deal, but they I kind of I think got sidetracked there on, on hiring and stuff like that. But um, someone from the audience, more a comment than a question, but saying that generally the education experience of this group of candidates lacks scientific depth. Uh, the too few comments regarding environment and climate change demonstrated a profound lack of scientific depth, a great concern. Um, I don't know if there's been a presidential candidate since Al Gore who really has made it, uh, you know, I mean, Inslee, who will not get the nomination, has made it his centerpiece, but uh, otherwise it's an issue for all the other candidates. It's not the issue. Um, I, could I follow Please, on that? Tim. It's more to than that the candidates are going to have to confront is it's more than just the debate over science, which certainly will happen in these debates. It's also the real public policy ramifications of some of the policies that they're proposing. So when you saw the little bit of the talk of the Green New Deal, you know, there's a lot of low hanging fruit in the Green New Deal that can be used against whoever the candidate is in the general election. So it's a real, uh, that head versus heart, and are you playing to the audience at home, or you're playing to a potential general election electorate, or it, Michigan probably is not a big fan of some of the parts of the Green New Deal, and coal country in Ohio probably isn't a fan of some of it. So it's a real 
it's a very fine line you have to walk as a candidate between you know, winning the room and not giving yourself some potential future headaches in October and November. Okay, before we move on to some other topics, a quick question from the audience for each of you. Um, this is more just fun and blue skying it. Um, who would be a good vice presidential candidate, do you think, or even a good matchup of a team? That, that just from what you've seen so far, you won't be held to it, but... Oh, hands down, Mayor Pete. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I don't, I, as much as I really want him to succeed in a lot of different ways and reasons, uh, I don't see him <laughs> having the, the overall chops to really be able to get that, you know, that presidential nomination, but I think he can do wonders for whoever the presidential nominee is for a lot of different w reasons. Background, this is intellect, his abilities, uh, he has this charm about him, um, his fundraising capabilities, and then also his, um, his geographical positioning. Oh, I thought you were going to say his shoes. And his shoes. And his yeah. shoes, yeah. yes. Great style. <laughs> yeah. Tim, your thoughts? Yeah. Uh, I agree. You know, it, in thinking about Mayor Pete, you know, I think it's going to be a challenge for him to go the whole distance for the presidential race, but he'd be at the top of my list if I was whoever the candidate is for the general election. And especially because if you look at kind of how he speaks, the issues he presents, uh, his background, you know, as, as a veteran, a Christian, you know, that's a hard... Um, it's going to be hard to really attack him in the general election. You know, we, you know, some people call the president Teflon Don. He could be Teflon Pete in the general mm -hmm. election and really could be someone that you send to all the swing states where the presidential nominee may have some hurdles, but Mayor yeah. Pete could bring it home. I think he'd be very appealing as a running mate. Barbara? Well, I've been sitting here trying to think of somebody else, <laughs> but I got to say, Mayor Pete is the one. My husband and I have been talking about this. He, he really would help a ticket. I know a lot of people are talking about Kamala Harris, who's tomorrow night. But Kamala, I, you know, I don't, I don't know that she would help out there that much. I think Buttigieg would, and I'd like to see him get a chance to do more things on a national scale and see if he's really got it to uh, be a leader. Okay. Um, obviously, we've talked a lot about what they talked about a lot tonight, which was health care. I did want to get into something tonight that they got into, and I was actually, I was actually impressed with how, uh, I mean, the, the CNN headline on their website I was checking while I was watching the TV, and it was talking, you know, gloves come off early. They got into it on health care and delineated kind of the two camps at least, the Medicare for all, get rid of insurance, or kind of a Medicare as an add-on public option, people can keep private insurance sort of thing. And they were getting combative, but I think in a helpful way for the audience, meaning, okay, I get a sense of where he is, and wow, I really know how to make Bernie Sanders upset. Um, <laughs> but, and, and so uh, the Kaiser Family Foundation has done some surveying on, on this as they've surveyed and everything. Uh, support for Medicare for All or a similar single government plan has more than 50% support, and it's been that for about a year. Um, an April poll found that 56% support such a plan and 38% oppose it. But, and as I say, it's a big but, support for Medicare for All dropped to 37% in favor with 58% op uh, opposed when Kaiser asked respondents if they would support Medicare for All if it eliminated private health insurance companies. So that, and that, they discussed that quite at, at length and rather heatedly. Um, do you think the ones who are actually supporting the all-government option, or plan, I should say, um, will be pushing it as f hard following this debate? I mean, did this debate maybe make that issue enough out there that some of them might be rethinking it? Yeah, I'm a little surprised. I, I would think they've done their own polling on this, and Elizabeth uh, Warren and Bernie Sanders have both made it such such a core of what they're doing when, uh, you know, I think it, just, it makes more sense to, you know, work with o Obamacare was on a track. There was a lot wrong with it, and a lot of the things wrong with it was when Obama tried to make it more acceptable to Republicans and ended up with a hybrid that nobody really liked. Um, but the folks who talked about that and building on that, uh, and I, 
I just cannot imagine that anyone, even Bernie screaming at the top of his lungs, can, can within a term or two terms get rid of private insurance. I just can't see it happening. Um, and I, I think it would be possible. I think this may go to the ability to win. It, it's, it's possible that, um, that, that Trump could turn that into into an issue favorable to him, as unfair as that would be, because neither he nor anybody else in Republican leadership has come up with a substitute. I, Tim, I know PRI actually has quite a big interest in healthcare uh, issues. We sure do. Yeah. It's a subject that comes up every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think it goes back to what I was talking about earlier about that kind of low-hanging fruit for the general election. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, this will be my one shameless self-promotion of the evening. I uh, interviewed for PRI's Next Round podcast, Scott Rasmussen is a very prominent pollster and you see his stuff uh, all throughout the media. Yeah. He's a very interesting guy to sit down and talk to. And we actually talked about this issue mm -hmm on healthcare reform and where people should be positioning themselves. And he's done a lot of work on this very subject. Mm -hmm. And um, the question, you know, do you support single payer healthcare? People like that as a term, but then when you drill down into the specifics of either their own healthcare, personal healthcare uh, situation, or what they think of the different options, it, support immediately goes south. He asked, um, I won't bore you with all the numbers, and I don't remember all of the numbers, but roughly about 20% support forcing everyone into a government-only health care system, and high 70s <coughs> oppose. Most people that he asked uh, like their current health care plan. Choice is a big issue. We saw a lot of the candidates tonight yeah. talking about choice. People like the idea of not only more you know, a public option per se. They want more private health care choices. And, and interestingly, one of the things that came up in the debate over Obamacare, <coughs> people want the ability to buy plans that don't cover all the benefits, that are cheaper and may not cover everything. They even asked, and I thought it was very clever the way they used, would X be considered a junk plan in your mind? And they asked the question, would a plan that covers a lot of things that you don't want, would you consider that a junk plan? And it was over 60% who would consider that a junk plan. So I think it's a very big risk going into the general election. Look at all the things that we just talked about there. That's a lot of attack ads and a lot of ways you know, that you could really um, uh, flood mailboxes in swing states in the general election. So, um, you know, the, I'll save the, you know, which plans we like or don't like and the flaws. Yeah. That's a whole nother question and a whole nother debate. But for a simple political question, I think they run a real risk of, that. you know, the, the thought of um, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren said, uh, of course not, we won't take away a choice. Well, that's not what they said in the prior right. discussion. Right. And the, the issue of taxes, <clears throat> that's a yeah. huge issue. And that's hard to communicate that, well, your premium may go down and you may have a net savings. Well, the estimates I've seen, it costs $32 trillion over 10 years. Well, that math doesn't add up. You know, everyone's going to have to pay some more. So there's a lot of holes that can be easily poked into whoever, whoever emerges their health plan. You know, I was watching, uh, I think it was Elizabeth, San uh, Elizabeth Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, <laughs> excuse me, and uh, Bernie Sanders, both really going after the, you know, billions of dollars that the insurance companies are making. And I'm thinking, well, one of those states you need to win is Wisconsin. I'm from Wisconsin, as some of you know from my past mentions. Uh, Wisconsin has a lot of insurance companies headquartered there, mm -hmm. including in the very liberal heart of it, Madison, Wisconsin. So, and a lot of healthcare tech. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So... Um, it's, it, there's a lot of ways this issue can cut in interesting ways, and, and uh, we'll kind of see how it goes, I think. I'll, I'll just Person. add this piece. You, I do have to give Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren a lot of credit, though, because they obviously really believe in yeah. their policy stance. Um, the way that they defend it, there's no 
if ands or buts about it they they go head to head defending it um whereas someone like a Kamala Harris I'm not too sure she truly believes in it she's been given polling and she kind of built the plan around polling to try to appease primary and and ge uh, general election audiences and I don't know if she'll be able to hold up to the scrutiny um, once it happens against kind of her opponents, whether that's Donald Trump or her Democratic primary opponents. So you got to give at least the uh, Warren and, and Sanders credit for for really kind of sticking to their their policy chops there um, on that one. Or with Harris, even from what she says on the stage versus yeah. in the spin room afterward, yeah. will she give the same answer? My experience, limited, of course, but I on as editorial page editor during her first campaign for Senate and, and uh, knowing her a little bit before that, I just, I just find she's, she's got her finger in the wind all the time. Uh, she can be very eloquent, and if she gets going in the right direction, she could be a great leader, but I haven't seen that kind of principle mm -hmm. at all coming out of and people oh, knock principle a lot on, on political campaigns, yeah. but you have to have principles somewhere mm -hmm. uh, because, again, you're being hit from all sides, from your opponents um, on your own side versus on the, on the other side of the aisle, uh, from the media. Uh, and so you need to really make sure you have your rudder really firm there so you really know where you're heading in terms of answering these questions yeah. because otherwise you can run into the situation of looking like the John Kerry commercial of you know, flipping right. back yeah. and forth on the, on the, the wind sail, whatever the, that right. contraption was. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's move on. Earlier today, California Governor Gavin Newsom signed SB 27. <laughs> which will require any presidential candidates, but we all know who it's aimed at, uh, and, and I believe gubernatorial candidates, to release their last five years of tax returns or be banned from the primary ballot in the state, uh, but not the general. Um, in fact, someone in the audience asked about this exact thing and said, what do we think the potential impact is of this? Uh, I also have just kind of a, what do you think the uh, future of it is in the courts? Uh, Barbara? I think it's thoughts? toast in the courts. I mean, it is not a test that the Constitution sets up. This is a, you know, a, a, a election for a federal office. I, I just can't imagine it holding up. And, and, um, well, yeah. I mean, I wish, I wish there were something we could do to get at the president's tax returns. I think the longer he protects them, the more clear it is that they would be very interesting. But. But um, I don't think this is the way to do it. And there's, there is talk now that, well, if California is trying to do this, other states, uh, red states, will be looking at ways to try to weed out Democratic contenders. So you've started a whole new front on the war, and we didn't You, you must that. list all the firearms you own. Exactly, right. yes, right. yes, yes, yes. Governor Brown awesome. vetoed this exact same yeah. bill. Oh, yeah. And in his veto message, he very clearly and simply stated, this is a very slippery slope. Um, and he's right. Should states be essentially politicizing how you get on and off the ballot? Um, it's, people, f people forget because it didn't ever really made it to law, but Arizona did pass a ballot, or sorry, a, a requirement that all presidential campaign uh, contenders had to um, submit their birth certificate. Uh, it was vetoed by the governor of Arizona because, for the same reasons that uh, Governor Jerry Brown vetoed uh, this version of the California bill, it's a slippery slope. Um, who says at what point, at what given time, are you going to start setting these random qualifications for this sort of stuff? And what does it say about your... <laughs> That about our financial disclosure rules, that we think what we have set forth in terms of our financial disclosure policies and regulations, that we need tax returns in addition to everything else. You know, th there are different ways to kind of go about getting the information that we that that the individuals in Sacramento are asking for. Um, I'd also like to point out that none of the other six current office holders, statewide office holders, have released their tax returns in the state of California. Uh, the Assembly Speaker hasn't. The Senate President Pro Tem hasn't. So if this is truly a government transparency thing, yeah. which I am all for government transparency, put it all out there, then why don't we make it a truly government transparency all thing? Right. Yep. All right. Yep. I kind of come down, you know, I trust the people to make this judgment. And we may agree or not, but they judged it wasn't that big a deal in 2016. Maybe a big deal in 2020. I do think another thing interesting, too, kind of on that point is, 
and maybe my 20 years working for elected officials, my jadedness is showing through here, but, you know, the notion that elected officials do not enrich themselves in office, regardless of how good their intentions are, I mean, certainly everyone who's ever been president of the United States makes millions of dollars because they were president. Everybody who's an elected official in the legislature all want to become a high-powered lobbyist or become in Congress and get all the perks and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, wonderful uh, riches in Washington, D.C. So I think it's one of those things that it's sad about our politics that that is the way it is. But, um, you know, Donald Trump may be a unique case uh, in this, uh, you know, on this issue, but uh, it is the kind of thing that they, they, the, uh, and some of the elected officials who propose this bill, you know, there's not a lot of innocent voices when it comes to elected officials and benefiting from the offices that they hold. Okay. Um, a sad topic to bring up, and, and I don't know that we're going to have uh, much new to bring to this, simply because it's the latest in a long series of things, but uh, that is the shooting at the Gilroy uh, Garlic Festival, three people dead, number injured, um, this being a political program, I guess let's kind of stick to, as someone in the audience even asks, uh, you know, where are the elected officials on this? What are they doing? What should they be doing other than, you know, the old thoughts and prayers thing? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Barbara? Well, I mean, I think, I think that assault, and this is a clear example of how state control doesn't work. This young man went to um, uh, Nevada. Nevada and legally bought an ass basically an assault rifle um, from a man who I heard on NPR this morning who was saying he um, uh, seemed like a nice young man. Of course, it was no, I don't know if anything would have come up on a background check. But seemed like a nice young man. Seemed like a happy person, which I thought was a perceptive thing for a gun seller to, you know, if somebody comes in and says, oh, I can't wait to kill people with this. It's a different thing. <laughs> he seemed like a normal, happy young fellow. And, and, uh, and then he did bring it across the border illegally, but we don't, at this time, staff our borders to keep people out Build a wall. so the something that that this is one of those perfect arguments for needing national regis uh, legislation to just get those things off the table uh and the other thing is you had you know you had police officers at this event and they've pretty quickly took they say within, within a, a minute, minute yeah. took him down um uh, and people are saying, well, if everybody had had guns, you know, well, it would have been less than a minute. I mean, it took a while to even figure out what was happening. And then you would have had a crowd of people all together shooting at... So, And they thought there was a second suspect. We don't know if there was or not, but that guy would probably be dead. Um, anyway, that's... I'm... John knows I... A friend of mine lost family in this, and so I feel a little more than usual. Yeah. Any well, thoughts, Tim? You know, what I thought when first hearing about this was, think of all the public spaces where we go every day. Mm -hmm. A school, on a train, on a BART train, walking down the street here, this auditorium, um, now festivals, where... We really don't think about it, but really any one of us could be kind of a sitting duck in that kind of environment. So I think the, what I found, have found sad in all of these various and two tragic incidents that we've had in the past <coughs> you know, decade or so, boy, this is a time when people should rise to the occasion and have some consensus and work together. And there are legitimate policy issues that should be discussed. And yes, it's guns, but it's also, it's mental health, but it's also some of these you could consider terrorism. You know, and what are the actions? You know, are we prepared enough? Do we have the provisions in place? Do law enforcement have the tools and the equipment, you know, in place? So I think this kind of thing really calls for, in response to all of these tragedies that we've had in California, Mm -hmm. It's a really big question, and you're right, you know, that's a more local question. 
the federal level, I, you know, I think clearly is the way, and I think you know, most elected officials in California or other states might be sweating having to deal with this issue, would prefer that Congress deal with it. And I wonder if you went back in time to 2009 and 2010, when the Democrats controlled all three branches of government, is there any regret now from that time that that opportunity wasn't seized to do reenact the assault weapon ban or whatever, you know, would have been the appropriate response during that time? Good question. Carson? It's also uh, uh, about holding, holding the political appointees, not just the politicians, accountable as well. If I'm not mistaken, it is illegal federally to sell a gun to someone who, that's, that's illegal in their home state. And so you have to show ID when you go to mm. pretty much any thing. I've never bought a gun, so I don't really actually know how it truly works firsthand. But I'm pretty sure it's a, a federal offense for someone in Arizona, Nevada, wherever, to sell uh, a gun to, an indiv- to a Californian that is illegal in the state of California. I believe he may have been living there for a bit, okay. he had an apartment there, but you're right, and that really hasn't hasn't come up. Right. So uh, there's, uh, so yes, there is the federal kind of component to it. There is the states versus states component to it. There is the politicians' thoughts and prayers component to it. Uh, but it's also a matter of why aren't we enforcing the laws federally as well as statewide? I mean, when a few years ago, the state legislature gave the attorney general's office a lot more money uh, in order to confiscate the, 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 all the illegal guns that were at, in the state of California, and yet nothing was really, really taken action on that yet uh, through yeah. the attorney general's office. So there's a lot of these components that, um, in a way, it's easy to point to polling. In a way, it's easy for some, a state like the state of California to pass the laws. What's then is the difficult thing is to make sure that those who are told to execute the laws are in fact actually doing it. And I feel like in a lot of cases, a lot of times, where the things really start to fall apart is the fact that we have the law in the books. It just doesn't really do anything. There's been an issue um, that has been in and out of the news over the past six or seven years um, in California. We call it the Arm Prohibited Persons Database. And that's the database where if someone is criminally prohibited from owning a gun in California, that information is supposed to be entered into the database. And that's how I believe both the retailer and law enforcement know to deny that sale. And the state auditor has done multiple audits on this. And despite more money being added to uh, come up with this backlog, there's a huge backlog of people who aren't supposed to have a firearm, who are legally prohibited from owning one, but, is, but they're not in uh, the database. And that's been something under Kamala Harris's watch and the current attorney general's watch, too. And that kind of stuff needs to be a priority. I, you know, in this case, it wouldn't have mattered, but may, you know, a future case, it may mm-hmm. actually make the difference. Yeah, considering this weekend, also saw a shooting in a New York City park. Uh, This morning, there was a shooting at a Walmart in Mississippi, and police in Wisconsin found uh, multiple people shot to death in Lake Halley, Wisconsin. So we'll be talking about this more in the future, I'm sure. One last topic before we get to our news quiz, and that is when I was in college in the late 80s, uh, there was a series of congressional testimonies given by someone named Oliver North. (laughs) You remember this. And uh, this was something that people were expecting, aha, this is going to really uncover you know, the Iran-Contra scandal and it's going to really destroy Oliver North. And through the course of, well, I worked in a copy room at the public radio and television stations on campus in Madison, okay? The point being, I had people coming into my office all day long commenting on this. And the conservatives would be coming in and saying, yes, he is really making a good, strong case. Liberals were coming in saying, that guy's such a criminal. Tim, Robert Mueller testified last week. It was very much anticipated, apparently dreaded only by Robert Mueller. Um, Did anything happen out of this? And is this another one of those things where Republicans can watch it, or you know, conservatives can watch it and say, "Aha, nothing stuck there." That you know, he didn't make a case against the president, and Democrats are like, "Oh, so close." (laughs) I I kind of viewed it as. As think of a lawyer 
potentially putting a witness on the stand. Well, it's kind of lawyering 101. That's why you always have a deposition of someone and you kind of, te you know, you kind of test them and see what's their temperament, how are they going to answer the questions, are they going to cause any problems for your testimony. And that's either way, you know, whether they're your pro witness or whether you're cross-examining. Okay. And it seemed to me that that did not happen in this case. And I think that's a case of political malpractice, especially when this was sold as this is the TV movie. This is so much better than the book. <laughs> well, I don't know that... The book was actually better. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know that congressional testimony is ever better than the book, but um, I think that, A, the Democrats might have been wise to hire Matlock or Jessica Fletcher. They might have gotten to the bottom of this a little better. <laughs> But I think you're exactly right. I think it's, the, it's in the eye of the beholder. If you think Trump should be impeached, you brush it off and there's so much in the book and let's move forward and let's keep going. And if you were a supporter of Donald Trump, you said, yep, case closed, yep, nothing to see here, let's move on. Barbara, your thoughts? Um, I, I basically agree. Um, I do think I, it's, it surprised me from the start that the, thing, the things he has said so clearly, such as Trump was not exonerated, uh, as, as he is you know, saying constantly, that, that, uh, and that's clear from, from the report. I, you know, I'm a little surprised that uh, Democrats or that anyone who's concerned about uh, Trump's uh, affection for the Russians um, and clear welcoming of you know of contact with the Russians that they haven't done a better job of getting out why you know why that is a concern it's hard because you have Mitch McConnell you have you know the leaders national leaders who are not paying attention to it but that has surprised me I think he did say some pretty damning things, but on the whole, it was a disappointing uh, performance. Carson? Uh, I'll just kind of add, I think, two points in that I don't think this was really about Donald Trump and whoever is the Democratic presidential nominee. This was much more about the uh, congressional elections, mm. the Senate elections, the, the House elections, trying to find little tidbits of news clips and, and, and sound bites that could then be used in commercials in, um, on bo for both sides, Republicans mm. and for, yeah. for Democrats, uh, in those kind of seats that they're trying to kind of fight over, uh, particularly on the Senate side, because again, you can't move through toward impeachment unless you actually win the Senate. Um, yeah. You can, you can think about it and dream about it and, 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 and pray about it all you want, but unless you have someone else, Chuck Schumer or someone else, as the majority leader in the Senate, you're not going to really kind of, uh, m no one's going to move through forward in that process um, or even think about it. Uh, so I think that was really kind of a piece of the, the political calculus was can we get... Can Republicans get and can the Democrats get those little pieces of nuggets that they, then they can use in their, in their uh, targeted uh, commercials? The second piece I think is really important is that uh, I, I think now having kind of seen kind of what the report is, and to be, on, to be honest, I sat on the stage a lot saying that we probably would not see the report before the 2020 election, so I'm actually quite surprised that it, it came out as quickly as it did. Um, but I think the Democrats really overplayed their hand from the election to this point in time of the sky is falling sort of situation, mm -hmm. uh, really making over the top sort of statements about how much involvement the Russians were, or how all these different components that now when the report comes back in a very legalese sort of way, that's not very uh, easy for this, the random person walking down the street to pick up the newspaper and kind of flip through and really get the essence of what's in there and all the technicalities. Um, they're looking for the smoking gun. The voters are looking for the smoking gun, and the Democrats kept on saying and going on every single news channel and saying, there's a smoking gun. We know it, it's going to be there. It's, it's there. And there really isn't a gun still smoking. Yeah. And it's going to be very hard for them to now take that and flip it around into a very concise sort of messaging that will really be able to kind of pin it onto uh, the pre President Trump, whether it's from a campaign political perspective or from an impeachment perspective, if we ever uh, go that direction. 
Thanks to our great panel, Carson Bruno, Tim Anaya, and Barbara Marshman. Thanks to all of you. Thanks to our volunteers and our crew. Have a great rest of your week.